Welcome to the People Who Read People podcast with me, Zach Elwood. This is a podcast aimed at better understanding other people and better understanding ourselves. You can learn more about it at peoplewhoreadpeople.com. And if you like my work and want to encourage me to do more, you can sign up for a premium subscription there. Over the next few weeks, I'll be doing some reshares of podcast episodes from early on in the podcast when I had a lot fewer listeners. These are episodes I think are strong, but that haven't had as much exposure as they deserve. This one I'm going to share with you now is a talk from 2018 from David Zulowski about interrogation techniques and strategies. It was only the fourth episode of the podcast, but unlike most of those really early episodes, this is already one of the most popular episodes. And I think that's just because Zulowski is so well known in the interrogation space. I assume a lot of people have searched for his name and found that talk of ours. And there are some good tidbits in there. I tried my best to focus on the most pertinent and interesting points that I found in reading his book. So it should have some really good practical takeaways for you. Okay, here's the talk with David Zulowski. Today's guest is David Zulowski. Before I bring him on, I'll just read a short bio of David's experiences. David is an expert in interrogation and interview techniques. In the 1970s and 80s, David worked in various law enforcement and and investigative jobs, such as being a licensed polygraph examiner, a licensed private investigator, and a certified fraud examiner. In 1982, he co-founded the company Wicklander, Zalowski & Associates. Their mission statement reads, Wicklander Zalowski is a consulting and training organization dedicated to supporting professionals in the difficult task of identifying the truth. Our passion for the truth has led us to become a world leader in non-confrontational interview and interrogation training. David and his business partner, Douglas Wicklander, also wrote a respected book on interrogation and interview techniques titled Practical Aspects of Interview and Interrogation, and I read most of that book in preparation for this interview. It's a great book, and I see a lot of concepts that would apply to people in all walks of life and many careers. Uh, Just one note, if you're thinking of buying it, there are several editions, so just make sure you get a recent or newest edition. All right, I'm going to unmute David here and bring him on. Hi, David. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Glad to be here. Very honored uh, to have you on here, uh, and we'll get right into the questions here. So I know that your book uh, on interrogation and interviews is highly respected in the field and that you do a lot of training of law enforcement and private companies. Can you talk a little bit about how popular and widely read your books and theories are and maybe how they're assigned to various classes and groups? Well, with our seminars, um, we've done over 200,000 participants going through the seminars. Um all of them get an outline book, which is a shortened version of the the actual textbook. The textbook itself is one of the uh, highest selling of CRC Press uh, on interview and interrogation. And um, it, plus, it's also used in a number of college classes um, for audit and investigation uh, around the country. And do private uh, private companies too might buy it to train their loss prevention staff too? Oh yeah, stuff. very often they'll incorporate that as part of the uh, the seminar that they uh, retain us to uh, present on uh, the interview and interrogation process. So a very respected book. That was my that was my initial uh, understanding from from reading about it. And uh, sounds like you get read by a lot of people. Your your theories are are being consumed by a lot of people. So when people think of interrogation, a lot of people probably think of kind of angry or forceful questioning, the kinds of techniques they see in movies and TV shows. Uh, Can you talk a little bit about how your approach and how it differs from those kind of interrogation techniques people have in their mind from from watching media? Certainly. The, 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 The things that you see on TV are not how it's done in real life. Um the you know makes for good tv makes for good drama but in terms of being legal and being effective uh, those approaches aren't aren't effective at all the the approach that that we use is very much a rapport based approach so it uh, you know if you think about what you see on tv it's basically conflict you have the interrogator trying to get the suspect to tell the truth and it's it's the two of them against each other. What, what we do is a much more rapport-based focus 
where we engage the person in a conversation and make it a, a safe place to offer up the truth rather than the conflict that you see in a, in a TV show or the movies. Right. Makes sense because one of your big philosophies is that you're making it comfortable for them not and non-judgmental because the ultimate goal is to get them to start giving you rationalizations of, you know, why they did that. And you can't, you can't get those rationalizations and excuses for why they did that. If they feel a, a big uh, adversarial. Yeah, it, I mean, this is, if somebody's going to tell you the truth about something that they've done wrong, it really revolves to a large extent about the issue of trust between the interviewer and the subject. And if there's no trust, Generally, there's not going to be any uh, admissions or communications. And if there are, it's going to be very difficult to get those um, from the individual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, was, I was just curious, are there any uh, shows or movies that you feel really uh, showed a, a realistic depiction of you know, how uh, these kinds of interrogations are done? A good interrogation is done these days. You know, they really stand out in that regard. Because of the time constraints of a movie or, or a TV show, um, these things don't happen with three or four sentences and all of a sudden the person confesses. Um, it happens once in a while, but those are few and far between. Most of the time it takes, um, it takes time to position the, uh, the conversation in a way that makes it okay for the person to feel that he can tell the truth about what he's done. And that's not something that makes good TV. Right. Uh, yeah. One thing that struck me reading your book was just how many different situation, situational factors you go into. And it's obvious, you know, it was obvious to me that you've spent a lot of time thinking about all the different factors that can be present, whether it's like the factors that uh, a person's background, a suspect's background, the, the room and how the room is laid out and how you're perceived, you know, by the, by the suspect, you know, like taking off some intimidating items of clothing or hiding plaques on the wall that are about, you know, reminding them of punishment. It was just a uh, very interesting seeing, seeing that you had obviously taken into account all these factors and, and, and recognize that, you know, basically there's no two situations alike and that there could be a lot of factors at play. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, to a large extent, that's part of the preparation and pre-planning to, you know, understand the individual uh, their lifestyle, how they make choices, what's important in their lives, um, how have they acted in the past in situations where they've been confronted, um, how do they handle conflict in their lives. I mean, all those things help you prepare and plan a course of action for the conversation. Yeah, that was a that was one of the more interesting ones when you said uh, when you're trying to predict how someone will react when you accuse them of something, uh, it, the most you know the most important information to have is how they have reacted in similar situations in the past, whether it's a previous employer or a teacher or something. You know that that's going to give you a clue to their the suspect's approach. You know to how they're going to come back at you. So I thought that was yeah, and that's pretty typical for most people is that. You know, we have a strategy of how we do things, either because it's worked for us in the past um, or because we can't think of any other way to do it. And so when it comes time to use something, we go back to what we've done in the past and try to reuse it. And if you can anticipate it, then you can make a determination. Is it is it helping the interview to be successful or do I need to? get them to try something else. One of your key concepts is that you should be vague. Uh, the interrogator should be vague about presenting incriminating evidence early in an interrogation. And you say this is one of the biggest mistakes interrogators make when they're laying out their evidence on the table way too early. Uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the weaknesses of that approach and why the, there can be strengths in not you know, showing that evidence immediately? The first inclination of... of an interrogator, especially somebody who's relatively new, is let me show you my evidence and you'll be convinced that I know you've done this. Um, and then you'll, you'll make an admission. 
the trouble with most of the cases that are developed is that um, they're circumstantial in nature. So if you're going to, for example, uh, confront a burglar and you were going to go in and tell him, look, here, I know what you did. You came in the screen door and you grabbed the TV and you went out the screen door. Well, what do you, we've got a, we've got a point of en- entrance and the door is left open. So that makes sense. Except what he really did was he came in through a bedroom window, closed the bedroom window and locked it and left through the screen door. So basically what you've told him is you don't know. And as soon as you make a mistake based on an assumption of what that evidence actually means, you're doing several things. One is you're telling them what you know and what else possibly you could know. So you may be limiting the admission that you're going to get. Um, the other thing is that if you're making assumptions about the evidence or you misstate the evidence, they now don't believe what you're telling uh, you're telling them they don't they think you may be lying to them and now distrust comes into place and resistance goes up so you know it's it's important in general to be in my estimation anyway in most cases to be somewhat vague about the presentation of the evidence because it allows them to fit the details that they know to be true in that vagueness mm-hmm. And, and so the communication is, is much more convincing that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It leaves more, more to their imagination because they're, you're, you're, you're speaking about vague evidence and they're taking what they know is true and thinking, Oh, they might know all these things, you know, but they, they're not sure. And they can't see the flaws in the, in the evidence. Yeah, exactly. Right. It makes sense. Yeah. That, that, that was a really interesting section. Um, and the other big part of it was that, that you want to have secrets that you hold back to confirm whether the suspect's being true later. So just to rule out that they're being weird or giving a false confession. Yeah. Uh, you, and you want to have some secrets held back. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely critical because at the end of the day, what you want is the individual confirming what you know from the investigation rather than you telling about it. So, you know, I mean, if you went in and, and showed a, a picture of the crime scene with the dead body laying there. And later they tell you, well, the body was on its back, uh, the right arm was extended, um, and there was a, a liquor bottle next to his head. Did that come from the picture or did that come from his memory? And you just don't know. So what you'd prefer to have him do is to describe the crime scene and have it match up to the crime scene that you actually had. And, you know, typically in most uh, police investigations, there's evidence that's withheld that only the guilty party would know. And that helps establish um, the, the truthfulness of the, um, of the individual's admissions. One interesting psychological detail to me were the strategies about removing reminders of the seriousness of their crime or their possible punishment. Uh, so for example, you know, taking, uh, plaques about arrests off the wall or taking off your handcuffs. Can you talk about some examples of that strategy and how it fits into, you know, the more, um, rapport based approach? Well, I, you know, I, I think about when I was a kid and my mother would say, David, did you break the lamp? If you broke that lamp, I'm going to ground you for two weeks. Did you break the lamp? No because I don't want to be grounded for two weeks. Um, so basically what, when a person's going to make an admission, they're, they're kind of, you know, can I save face here? Um, is there a way that I can minimize the amount of trouble that I'm in? Um, and so if you're offering somebody a statement attached to punishment, the consequences are right in their face. So it would be, um, you know, this is a class X felony that's punishable by 20 to 30 years in prison. Did you do it? Now, all of a sudden, what have you done? You've put that consequence. I could spend the next 20 to 30 years in jail, and it's right on the 
on the top of the list of things that they're thinking about. So trying to avoid uh, talking about consequences and what's going to happen after the, the fact is something that um, makes, it, makes it easier for the person to be forthcoming. Yeah, that, that leads me into a good lead into this next question, which is uh, some of the stuff I found most interesting in the book was your strategies for reducing the chances a suspect would make uh, denials. For example, you talk about early in an interview, if a suspect starts to den- make a denial, you might say something like, it's much better to stay silent than to lie. Can you talk a little bit about how effective that is and and how that fits into the overall strategy of, of trying to, uh, you know, to reduce those denials. Well, what, what you're talking about there generally would occur in a, in a confrontational uh, interrogation where the interrogator is trying to gain an admission has made a direct accusation. You did this, whatever the crime was, and then they get a denial. Now they're going to repeatedly return to that denial. And so that would be a way of, of trying to get them to stop denying so they listen to the rationalizations. Uh, Our preferred approach is to avoid getting any denials in the first place. So you don't directly accuse anybody of a particular crime. You don't make statements that we call them use statements. You did this. You're having financial problems, things that the person has to defend themselves against. So we generally talk in the third person, people, they, them, others, rather than the you type of a question. And it's much easier to avoid having a person start the cycle of denials when you handle it in that fashion. Right. And to make it clear, the the reason you don't want denials is because when somebody starts to, to den- deny something, it, it sets up in their mind a confrontational kind of thing because they not only have to defend themselves about the crime, but then they know that they've you know told a lie, but with a denial. So it sets up another thing that they're defensive about and just increases the, you know, it's the opposite of building rapport and, and, you're, and you're creating a more oppositional uh, emo- emotion there. Is that, is that basically summarizing it pretty well? Yeah, I mean, it, it really revolves around the idea of commitment. Um, people want to be, um, they want to, they want to, how do I say this in a, in a clear way? Um, they want, they want to have a, uh, a consistency in, in their decision making, their personality in their life. Um, and so once you commit to something, so if you say, I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat, I'm an independent, it's very rare that you can go to a party and have a conversation and a Democrat becomes a Republican. Just as in the same way that if you're talking about religion, you know, Catholics don't all of a sudden become Muslims um, because they're committed to a particular course of action and that's who they are. So. If somebody says to you, I didn't do it, in order to be consistent, they have to maintain that that denial of involvement. And if they can't do that, it creates a a difficulty uh, in equilibrium, internal equilibrium, and generally a change in emotions. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Another key strategy you talk about is downplaying the seriousness of the incident or the crime and offering the suspect rationalizations for why the incident happened. Can you give an example or two of the kinds of justifications that, you know, more uh, that can commonly help suspects save face in interrogations in that way? Sure. Um, most, most people, everybody, you know, humans are, are rationalizers. Um, so it's part and parcel of who we are, you know, I'm trying to lose weight. I didn't have breakfast. I can have a piece of cake at lunch now. It's okay to start uh, uh, to drive eight miles an hour over the speed limit because most police officers don't start writing tickets until 10 miles an hour over the speed limit. Um, it's, uh, it's okay for me to take a pen from the office because I do a lot of work home, um, but I shouldn't touch the, the merchandise or the money. 
that would be okay for me to take pens for the kids because I'm doing a lot of work and maybe some paper for the kids, but I can't touch the merchandise. Well, it'd be okay to take the merchandise as long as I stay away from the cash. Well, it'd be okay to take the cash as long as I don't uh, take it out of the safe. It'd be okay to take it out of the safe as long as I don't take the whole day's deposit. It's okay to take the whole day's deposit as long as I don't use a gun. It's okay to use a gun as long as I don't shoot anybody. It's okay to shoot somebody as long as I don't kill them. So everybody can rationalize a certain level of behavior, and generally they don't do something that they can't rationalize. So not every burglar is a rapist. Some burglars are rapists. Some burglars just want to take your TV. So they have to rationalize. So what the interrogator does is offers back rationalizations that don't don't change the culpability of the crime, but just mitigate it. So it um, you you took the money on impulse because it was just sitting there and the safe was open, versus you planned it out, or you took the money but you use the money to pay bills, take care of your family. doesn't change the fact that you took the money you stole from the employer. Um, all it does is offers a face-saving device that doesn't change the culpability for the crime. Yeah, I, I really like the section in there uh, where you talked about getting uh, more physical-based reads when you were giving them various rationalizations and seeing which ones might connect to the to the suspect and, and watching them, you know, look kind of standoffish and, and, um, you know, kind of mocking when they would, you would say something that they did not, you know, did not agree with, but then you could, you could get a physical read when they looked more engaged when you would name things that they related to more. I thought that was, that was interesting. Yeah. And that, and that's, you know, it's the same thing that you would do in an ordinary conversation. Um, you know, somebody is bored with your conversation. They're giving you, clues that I'd like you to change the topic or I'd like to get out of here. Um, or I'm very engaged with what you have and, and their behaviors and their attitudes uh, change. And so, you know, the rationalization is, is really the engine that drives the whole rapport-based uh, approach to the interrogation. If you're not using that, then you're, you're asking for a multitude of admissions. I did it. Uh, I'm a liar. I'm a drug dealer. I'm a bad person. And every one of those that you add on makes it more difficult for somebody to tell you the truth. So the justification process allows them not to change the elements of the crime, not to change the fact that they did it, but just to offer them some face-saving devices so they can preserve their self-image. So one thing I hadn't previously understood was that, uh, you only have to read the Miranda if you're placing someone under arrest or confining them. Uh, if that understanding is correct, if you're having a conversation where the suspect is free to go and no Miranda is needed, does this create an incentive for police in some cases to hold off on arresting someone and just focus on talking to them more informally so they don't have to do the whole Miranda warning thing? Well, it, a couple of things about Miranda that are important to understand. First of all, it, it applies um, only to law enforcement. It doesn't apply, apply to the private sector. Um, so it has to be public law enforcement. Um, the person second has to be in custody. And third, the police officer has to be asking questions. So those are the three components of uh, Miranda. Now, in in some situations, if if the and and the real tricky one is is the person in custody, and this is a whole uh, a whole area of the legal system. It, it depends on the totality of the circumstances. You know, how many officers are there? Is the person um, handcuffed? Are they locked in a room? Um, you know, what kind of questions are being asked? So there's that custody issue is a real can be a real tricky one. Generally, when police officers are going to do uh, an interview, it's going to be non uh, non custodial, um, so they're not going to read Miranda. And what they're looking for there is 
um, looking for the individual's alibi, uh, explanations for certain evidence, uh, other situations. At some point, that non-custodial may become custodial. And and this is where the the tricky part is. So, um, you know, is the person taken into custody right after the fact? Now, you know, if you have somebody who's, for example, um, um, they're doing a some kind of a fraud, and the police are talking to them, there's really no reason to take them into custody right at that moment. You simply, you know, inform them that you you want to ask some questions about some documents. What's their explanation for these? Um, you're you're free to go at any time, and you get you get the conversation. And at the end of the conversation, you thank them for their time. They go on their way. And if the, the case warrants it, then you go get an arrest warrant, search warrants, whatever else you need, and you come back and make the arrest. Then Miranda goes into play at that point. Um, so, you know, a lot of times um, the it's it's really more of an interview up front to get the person's um alibi or explanation for things rather than it is to necessarily get a, a, con, a, a confession from them. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, one big question I had when I was reading the book, and it's probably a common question from a lot of people. Uh, why do people talk so much at all? Cause it seems like the smart decision for almost everyone would be to immediately ask for a lawyer and just shut up. And you would think most people these days would have watched enough TV and movies to know that that, you know, is perceived as the best strategy. And I was wondering, uh, you know, why, why is there still so much talking and maybe, maybe there's less talking than there used to be. Is it, and maybe that's, has it, do you see it changing over time based on um, people being more aware of, of how these things play out? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think, um, People have a need to talk. You know, keeping a secret is a real difficult thing. I mean, whether it's a secret about a friend, I mean, you, somebody always wants to tell it. Uh, we, we had a, uh, an officer called who was investigating a, a homicide. Two, um, two people went to a trailer. They were going to do a drug ripoff, and they shot and killed the two people in, a, in the trailer. And then... They went to a party afterwards and told everybody what they'd done. Now, that makes no sense at all. Um, but that's what they did. You know, when I, I, I think it's it's the idea of keeping a secret is is really difficult. Um, you know, the the other the other thing, and this is some some uh, fairly recent research that had come out is, you know, what what a person who has done something's wrong strategy actually is. So what's your plan? You know, if if the cops pick me up or loss prevention picks me up, um, what am I going to do? And about 20% of the folks said, I'm going to just deny it. I'm going to deny, 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 deny. That's all I'm going to do. Now, this group tends to be the most difficult to get to confess because they've already made a commitment to a course of action. Here's what I'm going to do. And so this is the group that says, I want a lawyer. I don't want to talk to you. Um, and let me go. If you're going to let me go, otherwise I'm not talking. But there's about 80% of the folks. Um, and, and to me, the numbers were, were really surprising. About, um, about a third of the people said, I plan to come in and tell the truth. If I was ever asked about this, I'm, I'm going to tell the truth. So that means about a third of the people who've done something wrong are predisposed to confess and have already thought that's my course of action if push ever comes to shove on this. And then there's about the remaining 50% are, you know, I'm going to kind of see what they do. You know, how they treat me, what kind of evidence they've got, or what kind of evidence I think they have, and, you know, make my decision from there. So that means that, that an interrogator has 
if it doesn't make many mistakes, has a chance to influence about 80% of the people to go ahead and ad admit their misdeeds. And then there's probably a little bit more that you can chip away at that 20% that was going to deny till they die. Um, but, but people, I think, actually decide um, probably, well, for sure the number one reason is they think they're caught. So when we, when we sat down after our interrogations and said, why did you talk to us? Um, about 55% of the people said, I thought you had me. I thought you knew. So if, if you thought I knew and I could prove it, it's okay to talk about it now. It's not a secret any longer. And then about 70% of the people put a spin on it. They wanted to, they wanted to preserve their self image. So they would put a, you know, well, he came at me first. Uh, well, I might have rubbed up against her. Well, I, you know, I used the, the money to buy milk for the babies. Or, you know, I felt guilty about this. And so, you know, about three quarters of the people who wanted to, well, three quarters of the people who were ultimately going to tell the truth wanted to, to preserve that self-image. So, from the standpoint of being an interrogator, if you're going to to get admissions, you've got to convince them that they're caught without presenting evidence, as we talked about before. And the second thing is, is that you've got to offer an opportunity for that person to preserve their self-image, that they're not a bad person. They simply made a bad choice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It makes me think of when you talked about the initial strategies of um, interviewing them and not giving them, you know, not going straight into accusations, but because going straight into accusations without, you know, building rapport and doing rationalizations, they're, they're never, you know, they're hardly ever going to confess because they not only have to confess to the incident, the crime, but they also have to confess to just being a horrible person because you haven't given them that chance to make those, you know, rationalizations yet. So I thought that was a really powerful uh, point too. Okay, um, so let's talk about some specific behavior patterns. I know you wrote about quite a few uh, in the book. I was wondering if you could give just a few of the ones you thought were most important and most reliable when it comes to um, interrogating guilty suspects. Sure. Um, you know, you have to kind of look at it in terms of um, the interview versus the interrogation. Um, so. To, to kind of define those terms, interview is basically it's a fact gathering uh, process. It's where the individual does the majority of the talking. Um, the interviewer is generally leading it by asking a few questions, but the questions tend to focus on narrative responses from the individual. Um, so it's getting their alibi, the sequence of events, uh, explanations. It could be a process that you are interested in in an investigation. Um, but it's, it's basically just understanding the facts surrounding the case. Um, in, an, in an interrogation, um, it's really a change in purpose. And the purpose is to obtain an admission of wrongdoing. And the dynamics of the two are very different, and the behavioral uh, cues and how you use them is is very very different. Um, a lot of people today don't use the term interrogation; they just say we're going to interview the person, um, primarily because of the stigma around, you know, interrogation. It sounds like waterboarding. It's what they've seen on TV, as you mentioned before, you know, the yelling, the screaming, and all that. Um, and it and it's. It's just a word, and to me, the two words just help you understand where the conversation is. So on the one hand, you're gathering facts. On the other, other hand, when you use interrogation, you're, you're looking for an admission of wrongdoing and culpability to the crime. You know, the words are just words. I mean, you could use apple and orange. 
I mean, it's the same thing. Right. Yeah, and we should point out, too, that an interview can morph into an interrogation. It won't always, but the it can, it, it's too, they, they can both be present in the same talk. It, yes, exactly. Else. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, now, in, in, in the interview process, um, the interviewer is essentially uh, gathering the facts, but he's also making an assessment of is the person truthful or are they uncooperative? Now, we don't necessarily know when somebody's uncooperative if they're lying um, or they just don't like the process, they don't like the interviewer. Uh, I mean, there could be a lot of reasons. Um, but basically, when when you look at, um, and obviously very generalized here, um, much like in your books, you know, you, one thing doesn't always mean the same thing at the same yeah. time. Yes, it's a it struggle is. to write because, about because you have to phrase it Yeah, phrase, it is because, yeah. you know, on the one hand, you'll get a bluffer who'll do something in a card game when they're actually bluffing and they may do the same thing when they've got the hand they want. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very difficult and it's, it's, that's part of the, uh, the process is to make an assessment of the individual versus in terms of the, the, the context of the conversation, uh, looking at what do most folks do in this given situation mm-hmm. um, so that you're discriminating to what do most truth tellers do and what do most deceivers do. And then you're looking at the individual themselves. What's what's their norm and their behavioral norm? Um, so on on the one hand, if you looked at, um, well, let's take a, a a police officer doing a a traffic stop. Person's going ten miles an hour over the speed limit. They walk up. They ask for the uh, license, insurance. Um, inform them what they've done, then they're going to go back and they're going to check the, the, uh, the driver's license to make sure it's okay, the insurance it's okay, there's no warrants. As they're doing that, they now come back up and they hand the driver who's only done a speeding ticket his ticket and they, they assess his behavior. Now, normally, you know, you're not happy that you got a ticket, but there's not a lot of apprehension. But if he walks back up and that driver is nervous, uh, they're fidgeting, they won't make eye contact, what that tells the officer is there's something wrong here. I don't know what it is at this point. It could be there's a gun in the car. It could be that there is um, drugs in the vehicle. Um, but there's something wrong. Ask some more questions. And that's when the next statements are made okay would you step out of the car let's you know let's bring a drug dog in and the difference is is that you and i who've got a a ticket for ten dollars we're not happy because it's going to cost us some money but our license is fine our insurance is present we're not needing any warrants out this is over you know it's kind of like going to the dentist once they say no cavities ah nervousness is done but the the, the guy who's got something to hide, he goes, I got a warrant and I got a gun in the car. He's got apprehension and his behavior reacts differently. So if you look at the population as a whole in terms of traffic stops, here's something that doesn't look right and that says ask more questions. And that's, and that's really in an interview, we're looking for things um, that the that would tell us to ask more questions. There's something that doesn't seem right here. We could be innocent or it could be not. Yeah. You're seeing, you're seeing suspicious things and you want to dig into it more and see what is the cause for this suspicious thing. Maybe it's completely yeah, innocent. And, that, and, it's and that, as you point out in, in your books, it's um, there's no single behavior that always means somebody's telling you the truth or lying to you. It, and, and so it's the investigator or, in your situation, the poker player, who's got to make the decision based on 
the consistency of the behaviors, the context in which they're made, um, and looking at what do most players do in this situation, and then also what does this individual person do? Yeah, balance of uh, a balance of many things, and then try to make the best decision, and then still know you might be be wrong. But it, uh, you know, at least in you know, I, I sometimes hear people criticizing. Uh, these kinds of approaches for law enforcement. But to me, it's like, as long as it's being done like, like your approach is where it's non-confrontational and you're just using uh, things you find uh, to research, you know, to keep researching, it, it doesn't seem like uh, it's a, you're not like violating these people's rights by asking them questions and trying to dig in, you know, when you see things that are weird, you know? Uh, so I definitely don't see the problem, you know, when, when this kind of, these kinds of interrogations are done in a, in a, in an ethical way, like your approach obviously recommends. Um, I definitely don't see a problem because at the end of the day, you're just researching things you see that are interesting and trying to f- dig into those interesting spots. Yeah. And this is the same thing you do in a conversation. I mean, if you're having a conversation and you see, you see the person kind of hesitant and their, their eyes are kind of and they're shaking their head a little bit and you, mm-hmm. you might say, it seems mm-hmm. like you don't mm-hmm. agree. Yeah. You know, so you saw behavior that wasn't consistent with agreement. So let's let's ask what that might have been about. I mean, to me, the 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 newscasters who have experts come on TV and said, "Oh, he shook his head. No, he's lying." I I think that's a real stretch. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't like those guys. Of any you know anybody who reads it, I mean, you know, it's, you, you don't know and you. You know, you've got one camera angle and, you know, you're doing it, uh, um, you're doing it on the fly. And I, I think that's probably a bigger mis- misservice. Yeah, I think that's a, yeah, I could go on a while about those guys who go on TV and try to analyze, you know, those one-off spots. And they're usually doing it in spots where, like, they pretty much know what the meaning is, you know, or what the underlying situation is just to make themselves feel you know to look better because they know it's it's likely their interpret interpretation lines up with you know what we'll actually find out was the truth so um yeah i'm, I'm, always, I'm pretty skeptical about all those guys yeah it's always easier after the fact when you know everything to go back and say well look at that that's what that meant and yeah. th- and then you can probably do that with some accuracy because you know what the answer to the puzzle is well, yeah, the most recent one was with the Chris Watts thing where, like, after it was clear, like, he got taken into custody and it was clear, like, he had, you know, probably done those crimes, uh, the murders of his family. And um, and then then I saw a few, like, uh, body language experts come out and say, I knew that this was strange, you know, when this one small thing happened. And I'm like, I don't think you would have done that, you know, right, right when it happened because you, want, you wanted to have some safety first of knowing it was likely true. <laughs> So. Well, yeah, and and you know, with with those kinds of things, um, if, if you're an investigator, what you would look at and say, that's really unusual. Now, all that says is, you know what? Let's take a closer look. It doesn't you wouldn't bring the guy in and interrogate him at this point, but you would say, you know what? We need to pull phone records. We need to look for. Uh, infidelity. We need to look for money that's being spent wrong. I mean, whatever the case might be, all it says is, is here's something that shows concern. Let's investigate a bit more. Mm -hmm. And I I don't know if you'd agree with me, but do you find, uh, I mean, to me, like verbal, verbal analysis, uh, written and verbal analysis, statement analysis is, is, is so much more powerful for these kinds of things, just because it's so much less ambiguous. Do you, would you agree with that? I'm not sure if you've read like. Yeah, uh, no, I I would absolutely agree with that. Yeah, okay. you know the yeah because the choice of a word, um, has to be done cognitively. You have to think about it, and you have to purposefully choose it. You know why somebody scratches their ear is ambiguous. So I I, I agree with you a hundred percent on that. Yeah. And one interesting thing you go into in your book uh, was about pauses, you know, when people, uh, the interrogator will ask a question and then the uh, person being questioned will give a an un- unnaturally long pause before answering, which, you know, you would expect innocent people with nothing to hide would 
have a quick answer for you know most questions. And so that was an interesting um, uh, section in your book talking about how that will often be a a sign that someone's hiding something, yeah, whether it, they're guilty or not. Exactly, but, and, and except you know it depends on um, you know, again it depends on the context. Is the pause accurate? You know, if I said to you, uh, three, uh, give me three words describing yourself. Mm -hmm. Most of us don't think about that. And so you'd have to pause and think, you know, if I said, what do you look like? You'd say, well, I'm this tall and I've got this color hair and this color eyes. I mean, that's easy. But who are you as a person? You pause. Um, now, some some people will cover the pause if they're deceptive to make it look better. I mean, if you just stop talking for 30 seconds and then say no, it doesn't look good. So now you might cover the pause with a created job. You know, they reach down and brush the lint off their knee. Or cough. Uh, or they cough. Or they Repeat use, the uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, make, I didn't do it. Yeah, make a joke. Yeah. So those things cover the pause. So generally, uh, you know, the the simplest answer is the best answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One, uh, some of the interesting, uh, I keep saying interesting, getting kind of old, but one of the interesting things in your book, too, was uh, talking about the differences between innocent people being interrogated and guilty people and how, you know, guilty people kind of reach this stage fairly quickly of where they're just kind of shut down and and uh, demoralized and not protesting as much, whereas like uh, innocent people continually, you know, state their innocence and are, get continually worked up, you know. Uh, so you can kind of tell the differences in the in the energy levels. Obviously, you know, with all this stuff, it's not 100 percent, but um, it's, it definitely sounds like it's a clear pattern. And it, and, it, and it makes sense, too, because, you know, guilty people often don't, you know, they're not going to be the ones to often uh get angry and push about the stuff because, you know, they know, they know there, there are reason there's a reason they're there and they don't want to, they don't want to anger their interrogators by getting upset. They want to, they have a tendency to be conciliatory and, and friendly too. So that's part of it. Yeah. You know, it, it, we use what we call a, an introductory statement to begin uh, an interrogation. And it's, 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 again, we call it a non-confrontational uh, introductory statement and, and basic, basically all it is is it tells the individual who I am and what did I do, tells them the types of crimes or incidents I investigate, and then it tells them, um, then I tell them how I go about the investigation process in general vague terms. And the, the difference that you see when you say that to a truthful person, they're interested because you're telling them about the loss prevention or police work. Um, the guilty party, because of what they've done, sees it as a, oh my God, he's got me. And so there's an entirely different look that often you can see that helps support the decision that you make to, to press ahead with um, an attempt to get an admission from the person. So... I wanted to talk about one specific behavior, which was interesting to me because it had a kind of a corollary in, in poker. Um, <clears throat> bluffers are more prone to conciliatory and overly friendly behavior in bluffer and in poker. They can be. And this tendency might be noticed in situations where you'd think a relaxed person would react in an irritated way. So for example, the well-known poker player, Phil Helmuth is known for being pretty verbally abusive to his opponents and, acting, to put it bluntly, like an asshole often. Uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that Helmuth and others who act this way can sometimes get clues from opponents who have made a bet how they react to him, whether they're more friendly or conciliatory or whether they let their anger or irritation show. So if they show irritation, for example, with Phil Helmuth's irritating behavior, they're more likely to be relaxed and have a strong hand. Whereas on the other side, if they smile and act politely, they are more likely to be bluffing especially if they've been willing to express irritation in the past. So that was an interesting crossover because you will see a lot of people acting in very smiley, conciliatory ways when faced with, you know, when they're, when they're bluffing and, and just want to be, you know, kind of be friends with their, their opponent. And so that was an interesting thing that, that tied into, uh, 
tied into what what you were saying about people having uh, conciliatory behaviors when they're uh, when they're uh, you know a guilty suspect. Yeah, and and I you know I I had a, a child molester one time, and he you know he wasn't going to admit it, but you know we'd had an hour conversation about him abusing some boys, and uh, at the end of it, you know he gets up and says, "Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me about this." <laughs> You know, I mean, basically, I, you know, for an hour, I've been inferring that he's a child molester and he's appreciates my time and effort. Right, right. That's a clear. Uh, yeah, that's a clear, clear indicator there. Yeah, because, yeah, you just have to ask yourself, what are the chances of a an innocent person in this situation acting this way? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have, have you ever had a, somebody you question try to hang out with you afterwards? Like, hey, we should we should hang out sometime. <laughs> Not that. People don't like to hang out with us. <laughs> yeah, I, thought, I, I thought they might just be super, super friendly. Um, well, you know, I, I say that, but you know, the other thing that you'll you'll see as is kind of a general indicator um, of of people who are involved in cases is they'll often try to um, come back and test the waters. So they'll come back and they'll say, you know, I, I you asked me how much money I make, and I told you, you know. Uh, Thirteen dollars an hour. It's actually thirteen ten. Now they didn't come back to tell you about that extra ten cents. They came back to look at you and see: Are you treating me any different? How did I? They want to grade right, right. on on the play that they've just mm-hmm. had. Um, you'll also see this with um, on occasion. People will try to you know integrate themselves into the um, into the investigation. You know. You know. And and it can be because they're they're innocent, but in a lot of cases they want to kind of see what direction it's heading, and am I in trouble or not? Does that happen very often? Because I know that's like kind of a cliche sometimes in um, in movies and shows. Does that is that is that a fairly rare thing? Or I th- you know it happens. I think it's more rare than than not. With many uh, many podcasts and documentaries have uh, covered true crime lately, and we've heard a lot about false confessions. Uh, you talk a good amount about false confessions in your book and how to structure your strategy so that false confessions are less likely, much less likely. Uh, and it seems like your non-con- non-confrontational approach would very much minimize these false confessions. Can you talk a little bit about, about that and how you see your approach, uh, you know, making those much less likely. likely. Sure. Uh, there's, there's three basic types of false confessions that people generally talk about. Um, there's the voluntary false confessor. So this is the person who comes up and, uh, like the fellow who was in China that said, I killed Joan Benet Ramsey. And, you know, he didn't do it. Um, so, when you, when you have a voluntary person, I mean, it, it could be they want to be punished for something. It could be they're protecting somebody else. It could be, you know, they're mentally unstable. It could be a variety of things. And that's why in an investigation you keep the, uh, the crime scene and other details of the crime secret. Because if you're going to, if he's going to, you know, well, where was she killed? You know, well, I don't know. Her bedroom? You know, I mean, they're guessing. And so really quickly, you can generally weed those folks out. Um, the other type that you have um, are a, a coerced internalized. And an internalized, um, these folks, and again, I'm going to generalize, but generally um, have memory problems. Uh, they, may be, um, they may be younger. Uh, They could be alcoholics or drug abusers who have gaps in their memories. And basically, the interrogator convinces them that that they're involved and they have no independent recollection. Otherwise, the interrogator seems reasonable. Therefore, I must have done it. Um, And so these folks will actually believe that they have done it for a period of time. um, And they're not involved at all. Um, The third type is the course compliant and a course compliant um, individual, you know, tends to be, again, they're often younger. They're often uh, socially inept. Um, They, 
you know, they may have um, social problems with with families, friends, and others. Um, they they tend to be very compliant, and as a result, they they know they didn't do it, but to get themselves out of a difficult situation, they um, will go along. They'll say, "I did it," and if the interrogator is feeding them details, either of the they, they can actually make a confession that um, sounds plausible because they're repeating, you know, where did you shoot him? Okay, well, now you know the person was shot. You know, so, you know, I, I think I shot him in the chest. No, you didn't. Uh, how about the head? Okay. You know, so if, if the interrogator isn't careful and is feeding details to, to them, at the end, you're going to get a, a confession that sounds reasonable, but when you go back and you watch the whole interrogation, the details of each one of these uh, components of the confession were actually fed by the interrogator. Right, yeah. And you had some great uh, transcripts in the book about those kinds of uh, you know, situations where with the leading of the, of the person being interrogated and you know a person who had false confessed talking to him years later and just how kind of, uh, you know, compliant and laid back he was, like he never even seemed angry about the fact that he had been put in prison, you know, for however many years. Uh, it was just an interesting insight into the types of people that can make uh, false confessions. It's, it's really, uh, I mean, that's one of the things that as a, as a interviewer and a, an interrogator, you've, you've got to be careful about giving information to the person. Because that's how you're going to test the veracity of that admission that they make. You know, if, if you're giving them these things, they can make certain assumptions. They can take those details and feed them back to you. And it's very, very difficult to tell whether it's from them or it's something you said. Yeah, it made me think about those. I mean, you had some stuff about the child, uh, you know, the, the people that were uh, the children cases of, of people getting accused of, you know, kind of like satanic and crazy, um, child abuse, child sexual abuse, uh, situations and where it turned out to be, you know, it was basically these, the interviewers were, uh, the therapists were putting these ideas in their mind and the children in the same way you described were just going along with it. And it would get increasingly weird as the, you know, they'd follow up one idea with another and it would get increasingly weird and, the children were just like going along with it because the obviously the, the, the adults obviously wanted them to. So that's just really interesting insight into how those things play out. Well, and it's because of the suggestibility uh, of, of a young child, of, you know, somebody who is, is mentally challenged. I mean, you know, they want to be cooperative. And so they go along with whatever the person is doing. And so, you know, interviewing young children or, you know, people who have, um, who are mentally challenged or, uh, you know, are very compliant, you've got to be very, very careful because of the suggestibility. Um, a lot of police departments now have either specially trained uh, officers or they have uh, therapists who work with them to do these interviews with child sexual abuse just because of these, you know, types of things that, uh, that happened, um, you know, with the, daycare child abuse, um, you know, in the last 30 years. One other idea here, here, I saw you had talked about in the book about the eye direction correlating with deception truthfulness idea, uh, kind of based on the neuro-linguistic programming um, ideas. I know that theory has been criticized a lot in recent years, and I was just curious if you still were a proponent of it or had changed your mind on it, or what were your, what were your current thoughts on it well the first the first thing is it was it was mistrained from its inception um, people people would say well you know he looked to the left he's recalling it's the truth look to the right he's creating it's a lie it, it, all the IQs are, are really nothing more than an assist to find where you filed it in your brain that's really what it's for um, so if 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 um, you and I agreed to a story, uh, you know, last night 
we played we played poker. Okay, so if anybody asks you, David, I played poker last night. Okay, so it wouldn't be unusual if somebody says, what'd you do last night? You might look to your left, recalling, and say, Dave and I are playing poker. Now, that was an absolute fabrication. All you were doing is it was an agreed upon lie that you were recalling. But now if I ask you, um, well, where did you play poker? How many others were there? Where did you sit at the table? Who was on your left? Who was on your right? Who was the big winner? Who was the big loser? Now, creation has to take place. So in a, in where this is valuable to you is not to say this is truthful or it's untruthful. It's to say, here's something that was recalled. So as I drill down the story about our, our poker game last night, um, what I should see is more recall. If I start to see creation, I should start asking more questions about why Why would they, either he doesn't remember and he's making up an answer, that could be a possibility. Um, could be a possibility that he's lying. It could be a po- So all this says to me is, why would he be creating here? Um, and that just, you know, then you have to look at the question that you asked. So, you know, again, if I ask you, uh, give me three words that would describe you, as I used earlier, you might go to the right if that was your pattern. Not everybody's is this pattern. Some people reverse. But if you went to the right, doesn't mean you're lying. It just means I've not thought of myself in this fashion. I've got to come up with three words that describe me and my personality. What three words would I choose? So um, I think there's, there's value to it. The value is in looking at, is the person creating or are they recalling? And then you look at the context of the question and the question that you asked. And then does that creation or that recall make sense? So, it sounds like so, you you're a a believer in it still, and I, I was curious if that you know have because I I'm, I'm wondering if you had a lot of personal uh, experience with seeing it be um, seeing that approach yield results. Is would you say that's your main um, reason for for believing that it's a good approach? Well, for example, um, I had a young lady. Uh, we were we were doing a. Uh, uh, so a hundred thousand dollars in in diamonds had been stolen, and it came in to the jewelry company, and there were two people that processed it. So there's only two possible suspects. Um, the young lady I interview her, and she's I ask her questions so I can determine when she looks to her left or her eyes look to the left, she's recalling and right is creation. So when I, I um, asked, asked her about the, uh, the diamonds, I was able to clear her. But we also had some information that she might be using drugs on the job. And so I asked her, you know, what kind of drugs have you ever just experimented with? She gave several. You know, how many times would you say that you've used drugs on the job? And she looks to the left. So what, what she's just said is, I'm recalling using drugs on the job. So it, it, it's not, it's like any kind of behavior. It's not 100%, but there is an application. And the, But the important thing to remember about this is that it doesn't have anything to do with truth or deception. That's... That's, you know, you, a lot of what you're reading about the people that are, are, are criticizing it, they're exactly right. Because the way it was trained for years was, if you look to your left, truthful, to the right, lying, it's not that way at all. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, I'd like to read more about it. I, I'd only, uh, I'd heard about it a, a while back. I actually used to work for a guy who was a, 
neurolinguistic programming guy for uh, did seminars and stuff. I did that for like six months uh, several years ago. It was a while back. Uh, but and so I'd heard of the concept and then I had just heard recently how people were criticizing it. So I'd, like, I'd actually like to look more into it and see, yeah, what, what other people are saying about it. And uh, yeah, so that's that's interesting. Uh, one more question I think uh, I have here. How often do you think it happens that a, a read of someone, a read of a suspect as being truthful, innocent, truthful or innocent, changes the course of an investigation? In other words, if a suspect is a good liar and a good actor, good at mimicking innocence, how likely is it to change the direction of an investigation? I don't have any hard numbers for you, but it, it certainly could happen. Um, you know, the a lot of the miscarriages of justice, um, the investigators have predetermined this is the person. And... So they focused on them, excluding any other possible explanation. And, you know, it becomes uh, a self-fulfilling prophecy almost. Well, this is the person that did it. And they ignore evidence to the contrary that doesn't fit uh, their theory of the crime. Um, and in those situations, I, you know, it's, you, you should always follow the evidence of an investigation. The, um, I, I can't think of a specific case right off the top of my head, but you know, the there there have been people who've been, um, you know, interviewed and have gotten away. You know, they they managed to um, to lie to the investigator, and the investigator wasn't able to tell. I mean, if you read some of the the research on behavior and the interpretation of behavior. Um, basically, most of the academics would say that it's about the flip of a coin. Uh, you know, that you're going to be able to tell when somebody's truthful or deceptive. Some of that initial research was, was done by just showing you a video and it says, you know, the guy says, I went to the store and got bread. Yeah. Truthful or not truthful. I mean, you don't right. have an investigation. You don't have, yeah. uh, you know, you can't ask questions. You don't have a behavioral norm. I mean, it is a flip of the coin. Right. Uh, with, there's there's a new interview, um, well, it's not really new. It's back in the, the 90s when it was first developed by um, two academics, Fisher and Geiselman, and it, it's called a cognitive interview. And... The, the most recent research on the cognitive interview is that um, you can, and they've, they've expanded this to the cognitive interview for suspects. Used to be, it was designed to use on victims and witnesses to increase the amount of accurate information that you get. But then they started to look at it in, in suspects. And what they, they found was that uh, the investigator could identify the true status of the, the subject he was talking about between 85 and 100% of the time accuracy, oh, wow. which, is, which is unbelievably mm -hmm. uh, phenomenal. Um, in, our, in our seminars and, and uh, when we, we teach this, we do exercises. And, you know, although it's not scientific, that's about what we see um, in some of the group work, that they're able to take a story and based on the interviews that we're teaching them how to do, um, they can make a correct determination of whether the story is true or it's deceptive. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, definitely uh, having a lot more data points to compare is uh, much more likely to, you know, show some show some actual utility in using these things than just a, you know, one person saying one sentence. Yeah, that's, that's not going to show you much uh, reliable information. No, you're exactly right. And that's why, you know, most of the interviewing that we do, we, we advocate using open-ended questions so that a person has to give you a narrative response. So an open-ended question would be, tell me about what happened there, and you just let them talk. Tell me more about this, and you let them talk. And, you know, we start to look at it, to go back to the verbal component, you know, truthful people tend to have... Um, 
you know, they tend to be more detailed. They tend to be more expressive. They tend to include emotions that are appropriate. I mean, so the style of, of their responses gives you a lot more in, um, you know, I don't know the application in poker because I'm not much of a poker player other than I would come and give you my money. Um, there's um, what are called micro expressions. Mm-hmm. And micro expressions are, are the basic human emotions that we all have. And so if I got a good hand, there would be a fleeting. And when I say fleeting, it could be, you know, one fifteenth of a second. Um of your your look of happiness that comes on your face before you pull the mask of of non commit committal over it, um, or you get surprise, or there may be a momentary frown of anger that you didn't get the card that you were looking for. So you know they'll just be fleeting, and then the mask will go back over. Now I don't know how well it would work in the in in the poker environment because folks lock their faces up so much yeah that's the thing it's like uh to me the micro expressions uh are uh i i don't think they have much application to poker i could be wrong but it's just because everybody's much more focused on like keeping a strong stoic poker face and not moving their face around as much whereas like i think those small expressions come more into play when you're in a uh you know a more informal setting where you're not you know you aren't expected to be to be watched like every second kind of thing um yeah yeah that that's kind of what i would expect as well i mean because you you want a a mask of neutrality generally Mm -hmm. yeah that's that's most people's mo is you know as soon as the stakes get decent stakes you know in in a decent sized hand their their masks come on and they're they're kind of focused on being unreadable but uh, let me uh, sum up because I was trying to not have have you take up too much of your time here. Uh, I just want to say your book is great, and I got so many interesting tips on thinking about people and talking to people. Um, and I, I really liked your approach, your guys' approach of of you know pointing out that this isn't a one size fits all thing, and you go into a lot of different factors that can influence these things, and say, oh, you know, this this can be a sign of uh, somebody being guilty and anxious, but at the same time, remember it could be a sign of them, you know, just not liking police or whatever, you know? So I, I just really like that you gave a lot of balance to many different things that could be true. And I thought that was very um, commendable. And uh, I wanted to say, I think many people would benefit from reading this book, whether it's just understanding you know, how to negotiate better or, or understand people better or manage people or whatever. I think it would have a, a lot of applications. That was a talk with David Zalowski. This has been the People Who Read People podcast with me, Zach Elwood. You can learn more about it at peoplewhoreadpeople.com. Thanks for listening.